Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Stacy, and I'm presenting my work with my co-authors, uh, Christina Santana and Eleanor Long from Arizona State University. Can you guys hear me through this thing? Okay. So uh, my work is on food science today, and broadly food science is the selection, flavoring, preservation, storage, or distribution of food. And in this paper, we're particularly interested in everyday food science practices. So for example, growing, fermenting, brewing, canning, pickling edible materials, as well as foraging and using food for medicinal purposes. So our reason for focusing on food science within HCI is twofold. So first, we see at-home food science as a form of amateur science practice. In other words, food experimentation is generative and it results in new knowledge. We also see food science as aligned with recent work in sustainable HCI. So these community-driven ways of storing, sharing, and preserving foods uh, are aligned with recent work and sustainability. So our research questions in this work are across these two themes. So first, we want to know how is food science expertise scaffolded, and also how are these practices positioned as deliberate alternatives to top-down systems. The outline of my talk today is quite simple. Uh, I'm going to tell you what we did, what we found out, and then what it all means for interaction design. So I'll begin with the methods. So our methods were actually twofold. So first, we conducted 12 in-situ interviews with 14 practitioners, so people who experiment with food science on a daily basis. And these interviews took place at the participants' place of work with food, and they, they asked participants to walk through their daily routines in regards to food preparation and also to demonstrate a project of their choice. And more often than not, uh, the researchers, so us, uh, we actually ended up collaborating on that demonstration with the participants. So as part of the study, um, I personally ended up learning how to forage, um, how to make kefir and sauerkraut. Um, I learned about encapsulating placenta, which is the practice of dehydrating and grinding out placenta as a dietary supplement for mothers. Um, also, I walked through the process of making beer, and um, I learned about caring for domestic animals. Our other line of inquiry um, was around these two workshops that we conducted at our design studio. So we invited the food science practitioners back to our lab. And the first workshop was a hands-on workshop where we, again, made kefir, sauerkraut, and kombucha with the participants. And then the second workshop was a co-authoring and writing session. And actually, this resulted in a joint um, publication with the food science practitioners as co-authors in a community literacy journal. In the paper, we reference the participants by their primary line of work, and you could see that these practices are really diverse, so fermentation, beer brewing, health and nutrition, coaching, herbal medicine, encapsulating placenta, um, canning, etc. So I should note, though, that there is substantial overlap um, between these practices. So a lot of the participants shared a joint interest in fermentation, for example. Most of these practitioners um, have actually been doing their practice for decades. All of them have been doing it for several years, so we really consider um, these participants to be experts in their domains. So the findings I'll talk about today are across four categories. So the motivations, the types of knowledge, um, how the expertise was scaffolded, and some of the challenges and workarounds in everyday food science. So the primary reason why participants started working on food science projects is actually health. So whether to address a particular health problem with herbal remedies or to eat less processed foods or to increase uh, gut um, flora, participants wanted to be healthier. But as they became more fluent in their practice, they actually continued to do food science because it was fun. And so these were the two primary motivations that we found. But in addition, participants discussed other values. So they wanted to share their food science projects with their friends and family. Uh, they wanted to connect back to the tradition and culture. So a lot of practitioners actually learned their practice from a family member, and they wanted to pass down that tradition. And there were a host of sustainability motivations, so eliminating waste, uh, preserving food, and working outside of mainstream food production. 
So what kind of knowledge uh, did participants draw upon in their practice? Well, first, um, all of the participants actually relied on concepts from professional science throughout their work. So they referenced botany, microbiology, chemistry, medicine. For instance, sterilization was something that all of the participants talked about throughout their practice. They were also fluent with several types of scientific instruments. So thermometers, spectrophotometers, um, different measurement instruments, as well as pressure canning systems. In addition, participants also had specialized uses for everyday tools. So a blender um, and a food dehydrator were used to grind and encapsulate placenta. A cooler was converted into a mash tun um, to ferment beer at a particular temperature. A monocle was used to identify plants that were being foraged for. The human senses themselves also served as a form of expertise. So participants described their senses as being different or evolved um, when compared to other people. So one fermenter told us, well, the food fermentation just trained my taste buds in a different way as it is for most people. And once developed in this, in this more advanced way, the human senses actually serve to troubleshoot parts of the practice. For instance, here, um, I love this quote by the, by the beer uh, brewer who kind of talks us through the different things that could go wrong in brewing. He identifies that through taste. So he says, if it's too sour, it's a bacteria problem. If it's like a yeasty flavor, well, you didn't let it ferment for long enough. So that's an example of human senses being used as a form of expertise to troubleshoot the work. And finally, uh, like related to other types of science, at-home food science practitioners actually had a specialized language to describe parts of their practice. So I've heard words in the study that I've never um, encountered before, so um, cold crashing, uh, water bath canning, salve, media-based aquaponics, these really specialized terms used to describe parts of the project. The way that participants acquired these diverse types of knowledge um, are also really interesting. So to, to some degree, all of the participants actually had some formal school or formal training within their practice. So whether by attending classes at a university or through a community center, um, they all had sort of some formal education in their field. They also relied on, surprisingly, on professional sources. So I've heard all of the participants talk about referencing peer-reviewed publications or books or journal articles that related to their domain. Participants also, of course, used online communities, so Facebook groups, forums, YouTube channels to troubleshoot parts of their work, um, and in-person interactions. So a lot of time, people would share a, a culture, a starter, or a ferment, and in that process of sharing, they would actually share bits of knowledge about their practice. A lot of people also had longer-term mentors, so a friend or someone who introduced them into the practice and taught them the skills. And finally, experimentation. And experimentation actually proved to be the most important way of acquiring knowledge in food science. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about experimentation here. So all of the participants discussed many forms of experimentation as a way of learning. Um, this quote by a fermenter kind of sums up that process. So I like to expect that it's going to work, but I don't really know. And a lot of times, I'm just trying it. So a lot of trial and error. Um, to gain knowledge about food science. And with this trial and error, of course, we saw many instances of failure. Um, and these range from things breaking to foods tasting kind of uh, weird and funny throughout the projects. Um, but in the practice, the, the failure was actually seen as generative. So participants used failure to learn and adapt their practice and succeed in the future. And because experimentation was so important, all of the participants kept really detailed records of their practice. So whether through handwritten notes or spreadsheets to more advanced ways of capturing their projects through um, cameras and iPads and then sharing that on social media. They were, um, so there were some high level challenges that all of the practitioners uh, discussed in their work. And these basically came down to two things. So first, there were negative perceptions of food science materials 
and also the challenge of time and habits. So as you might expect with some of these food science materials, uh, participants encountered skepticism, fear, and sometimes even disgust when they presented their work to other people who were not familiar with the practice. And even the participants themselves said initially when they were being introduced into their craft, they were kind of um, surprised and maybe weirded out by some of the materials. But over time, they developed really deep and nurturing attachments to their materials. So in particular, they tended to anthropomorphize the materials that they worked with. So here, Fermenter is discussing um, the way that she sees SCOBY, which is the kombucha starter, throughout, um, throughout her work. So she says, every week, the SCOBY creates a baby. Yes, it becomes like a child in our family. The whole family talks about the kombucha. What are we brewing today? So it was not uncommon uh, to hear people discuss the foods as if they had human-like qualities. So starters feeding and eating, breeding, or even having pet names in the families. And the second challenge was time and habits. So uh, food science operates on a slower clock, right? So some processes take hours, days, or even months to complete. But all of the participants discussed their transition into food science as a slow and gradual process. So many people started with something as simple as just changing one ingredient in their project and then evolving to more complexity over time. So one participant explained this process. She's saying, it's a slow evolution. This week we make our own mayonnaise. Next week we might make something else. And the slow transition enabled participants to naturally integrate food science into their lives. So many steps and procedures became parts of their ha habitual routines and parts of their daily lives. So here, a participant describes her routine in regards to fermentation. And she says, well, then I'll add the fruit for the second ferment, and then I'll put it in the fridge, and after that, I'll brush my teeth. You, you have to work it into your life, if that makes sense. So in other words, food science wasn't this one-off uh, intervention. It was part of people's lives, and it was deeply integrated within their routines. Uh, so now I'd like to wrap up with some design implications for HCI. So our findings have shown that food experimentation is a generative practice. So it is systematic, and it produces new knowledge. And the participants draw on professional research, as well as mentorships and hands-on trial and error to develop these really highly nuanced um, ways to, to learn and understand food science um, and this really deep expertise in food science. So here I want to turn back um, to the initial framing of food experimentation as a form of amateur science practice and talk about ways that design can scaffold community literacy. So I've talked about the importance of trial and error and also the fact that all of the participants document their work to document their experiments. So here there's an opportunity for institute documentation and sharing technologies. So new tools can allow practitioners to annotate and document their projects and methods and outcomes. And these annotations might also be combined with sensor data, so images, videos, and also measurements such as pH and temperature and carbonation levels of different projects. Uh, and in addition, we suggest putting this type of documentation within the context of professional research. So in other words, aggregating at home and professional science knowledge. So for instance, systems might visualize at home food processes alongside professional research. And this of course would allow the practitioners to deliberate and discuss some of the professional research within the context of their practice. Our second implication area is around this idea of habitual sustainability. So indeed, food science is aligned with sustainable HCI because the practices are around improving human health, reducing waste, working outside of mainstream food production. But what's interesting is that food science um, isn't this one-off intervention. It's actually really deeply integrated into participants' routines and daily lives. <clears throat> 
So we saw that by slowly transitioning into food science, one project at a time, participants were able to integrate their work with their daily lives. And so we suggest that interactive systems do the same, meaning facilitate slow transition into habitual sustainable practice. So uh, practically speaking, on one hand, really popular technologies such as calendars and task lists and reminder systems might help users incorporate um, food selection and preparation into their current routines. But more radically, technologies might help people adapt their routines to include more complex food science projects. And finally, I want to end with this um, idea of nurturing and caring for the food science uh, materials. So participants really deeply cared about the projects they worked with. And this led them to overlook some of the imperfections and persist in their practice. So this suggests applying interaction design to support deep nurture and care between people and materials. So new systems maybe might allow people to document the histories, origins, and personalities of starters, cultures, and ferments, and construct narratives around their project. And this, in turn, might support more meaningful relationships between people and their food materials. And with that, I'll, um, I'll stop and ask for questions. Yep. I'll just talk really loud. Um, thanks for that. Did you teach the cost of acquiring some of the materials that are used in these different practices and how that might affect their implications for design within HCI? Yeah. Um, so that's a really interesting question. So actually, we found that materials were acquired in three different ways. Um, so some of the some of the materials were actually high-end and purchased um, from professional sources, so the um, thermometers and pH meters and things like some of the aquaponic systems were professional level, and those were indeed a little bit expensive. Um, but a lot of the materials and tools were actually modified and appropriated from off the shelf. So I mentioned the blender and the food dehydrator for placenta encapsulation, or uh, just a regular cooler was used to ferment beer at a particular temperature. Um, and then we saw a lot of this on uh, the last point of bartering, sharing, and um, kind of foraging for both the food and the materials. And this was actually pretty much free for the community. Um, and so these, these three levels, I think, you know, all, all three can be applied and supported by HCI. So the higher end professional equipment might be done in collaboration with professional scientists, but the other two. Um, systems can support sharing and bartering of materials to make the costs more affordable. Okay, I, I think it's a very short, right? Okay, thanks very much for the talk. Really interesting and exciting work. Um, I wonder if you could just very quickly comment on uh, the relationship between uh, sort of sustainability, experimentation, and waste. And I think just about that, you know, when you see failure, how, what are people taking from that? Mm, that's a good question. So the primary goal was to, um, for a lot of the people, was to preserve some of the materials that were about to be discarded. So in fact, pickling um, and fermenting were seen as a way of preserving. But there was, um, yeah, some things were, you know, I wouldn't say wasted, but when things failed, then there was a question of what to do with that material. Um, and all, actually all of the participants had compost bins, so that, or they had chickens, or they had live animals. So I wouldn't say they threw anything out, but they found ways to kind of re recycle that or reuse that. Maybe not for eating, though, for some cases. 